What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another Fantasy Files spoiler-free review. Today, I'm going to be talking about some books I read recently that have to do with vampires in one way or another. First up, we have Bloodlines by Peter Hartog, then Lights of Prague by Nicole Jarvis, and saving the best for last, we have Empire of the Vampire by Jay Kristoff. I enjoyed all three of these books for very different reasons, and the vampires in each book are really unique while also kind of adhering to the classic vampire archetype. You won't find any Edward Collins here. These are vampires for adult readers, and most of the vampires on this list are not friendly and often downright scary. Before we get into it, though, please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons down below here on YouTube. It seriously helps us out a lot. And you can also follow us on Twitter at Files Fantasy or look up Fantasy Files Podcast in the search. With that out of the way, let's get into our spoiler-free review for each of these books, starting with Bloodlines by Peter Hartog. So I'll admit this one isn't totally about vampires as far as vampires like carrying the story. There just happens to be a bit of vampires in this book and I read it around the same time as these other two I'm about to mention. Bloodlines is a super fun urban fantasy slash sci-fi book. There's a ton of a ton of different genres kind of mashed into this book, and it reminded me a lot of a futuristic Dresden Files. Our main character, Tom Doc Holliday, doesn't have magic in the typical sense, but the world is filled with spells, AI-driven brain implants, cybernetics, aliens, various magical mysteries, and the reason we're all here today, vampires. Basically, this takes place in the future on Earth, and a series of dirty bombs, terrorist attacks, and multiple pandemics has led to a tear in the fabric of reality, allowing curious and non-threatening aliens called Velens to make contact with Earth, as well as a bunch of other supernatural baddies and beings. The Velen have taught the humans magic that they can use for a number of things if said human is attuned properly to these things called Nexus Nodes, which came about with the terror in reality, and also allowed the engineering of spell-strengthened steel walls known as Spellforged Steel. We follow Detective Tom Doc Holliday, who works as a detective who is mostly looked down on by his peers and betters, but he has a talent for something called the insight, which allows him to open his third eye and see things for what they really are to varying degrees of weirdness. Sometimes he can see things that happen in the past or feel the emotional climate of a room or picture or get a better read of a person or object much like Harry Dresden's sight. Because of this ability, he gets roped into working for the Special Investigations Department, a secret group that investigates the more odd and supernatural cases of Empire City. The case revolves around this girl who is found dead, completely drained of blood, and they spend the rest of the book investigating crime scenes, doing work, and hunting vampires. I think the thing that stands out the most in these books is the I loved reading about them traversing a futuristic New York and all the ways the world has changed since there was a big shift in technology. Tom Holliday has an implant in his head that actually very close with uh, but I really loved the characters and the way they interacted with each other and I never got bored of this means being a little critical if I had to choose something that I didn't like as much it was probably the plot in some ways there was a lot to keep me entertained in this book but at about 60% of the way through, I was kind of waiting for the characters to 
kind of get to the point, it all started to blend together a little bit at that point in the story. And I was mostly waiting for the big reveal, although the overall mystery did keep me guessing as to what was actually going on, which is a sign of a good mystery book. It never felt predictable. And I felt like just when you're like getting clues and you think you know where it's going, it kind of turns you down a different road and keeps you guessing. But for the negatives, I, I think it mostly comes down to this being a debut novel. So I really can't fault it for that. And I bet the next books in the series will just get better and better, much like the Dresden Files did. All in all, I really liked it, and I would recommend it if you're looking to scratch that Dresden Files itch while we wait for the next book. It was a great palate cleanser in between big fantasy books, and it was a welcome break from the norm. The other night, I was actually trying to find something to read and felt an itch to go back to this world, so I picked up the second book in the series and really like it so far. The next one I'm going to talk about is The Lights of Prague by Nicole Jarvis. This was a book that I liked a lot and was just one of those books that once I saw the cover and read the description, I immediately knew I was in. Um, it follows Domek Mishka in a gaslight era of real world Prague. And he works as a lamp lighter, making sure that the street's gas lamps are well lit when the sun falls. One of his duties include being incredibly knowledgeable of and ready to kill vampires who stalk the back alleys of Prague once the sun goes down. Vampires who are known by the name of Pijavitsa. On one of these outings, after killing a vampire, he discovers a jar with interesting um, kind of sigildry and runes on it. He soon discovers that this jar contains a Will of the Wisp, which is essentially a small genie with unlimited wishes, and it's now bound to him. He is intensely distrustful of all things supernatural, but soon comes to have kind of a working relationship with the Wisp, and discovers that the jar and the being inside are worth more to the vampires than his life. It's his job to discover what the vampires want with the wisp and stop a citywide conspiracy from destroying Prague. The chapters alternate between Domek and Lady Ora Fisherova, who is Domek's love interest throughout the story, but she has some darker secrets of her own unbeknownst to Domek. I thought it was really cool how well this story balanced action, drama, and romance. I feel like they're all there in equal measure, and I really loved these characters working together and unraveling the larger conspiracy at play. Again, if I had to pick something that didn't quite hit the mark for me, it would probably be the predictability. I absolutely loved the characters and the story, but I was never really kept guessing very often and had a pretty good idea of where things would go the whole time, which isn't to say it wasn't enjoyable because it absolutely was. It just wasn't very mysterious. So without giving too much away, there are good and bad vampires, but these are not your Twilight or Vampire Diaries type of vampires. These are all real, scary, classic vampires, and the tension between humans and vampires is really palpable and not taken lightly in this city. Young girls don't go running off in love with any vampires in this world. It was a super quick read, and I don't know if it's going to be part of a larger series, but it worked really, really well as a standalone. I highly recommend it if you're looking for a really good and short palate cleanser. <music> Lastly, we have Blood Song by Anthony Ryan. What's that? It's not Blood Song? Okay. Uh, next up, we have Interview with a Vampire by An No? It's Empire of the Vampire by Jay Kristoff? The joke is that it's basically Blood Song with vampires. And there's literally an interview with a vampire. 
So this was one of my favorite books of 2021, almost making it into the top three. In this book, we follow a character named Gabriel de Leon, who is imprisoned by the vampires he spent his life hunting and being forced to recount the story of his life and how he became the most legendary vampire hunter in the world, much like Blood Song or Interview with a Vampire, except it's a vampire doing the interviewing. De Leon joins the Holy Brotherhood known as the Silver Saints when he finds out he is a half vampire himself. This is an order dedicated to eradicating the world of vampires and hopefully putting an end to Day's death, the ongoing event that essentially removes the sun from the sky, allowing the vampires to roam freely. The men in this brotherhood are all children of one vampire parent and one human parent, which allows them special vampire-like abilities depending on their bloodline. We see Gabriel grow up in the Order of the Silver Saints and become more and more renowned for killing extremely powerful vampires and watch as he creates an unbreakable bond with his fellow saints. The book consists of three timelines going on at one time, but it's never really confusing. Essentially, we have our present day timeline, which is the ongoing interview with the vampire kind of interjecting every now and then with a comment or a question. And then we have the early timeline, which is Gabriel as a wide eyed, hopeful child and teenager. And then the timeline just before he got captured when he's a little bit older and very, very jaded, world weary and broken um, and selfish, which leads us to question how he got this way. This is one of those rare books that made me care about every single character, um, which is really a rare feat for a book to do for me. By the end of it, the character I liked least at the beginning became one of my favorites. And now I, I love animals. I mean, I, I have a dog that I love very much, but I usually don't care about animals in books that much like my co-host Gabe does. Like I'm not one of those like people who really like animal companions in books. However, this book made me care so much <laughs> for the horses that are animal companions to Gabriel. Each one had a very distinct personality and you can just tell that he cares about them so much. And I definitely teared up whenever they would get hurt or be in danger. Speaking of people getting hurt, this is a very, very grim, dark type of world. And there are really horrific things that happen all the time, as you can imagine. Vampires are basically the ruling class and do whatever they want. And even most of the humans are very corrupt and selfish, including the Order of the Silver Saints. This book has very few heroes, I feel like, and the overall feeling of the world is very oppressive and gave me kind of a Bloodborne vibe if you've played that video game. I'll also mention that this book has a gratuitous amount of creative cursing, as well as a lot of drug use. So much drug use, in fact, that as an ex-addict myself, I was a little triggered at times, just something to be aware of. I think my favorite thing about this book was just the character and story of Gabriel. He's such an interesting and complex guy and you never quite know what his real motivations are or how he's going to react to something. He's always surprising and he's extremely skilled but not invincible and sometimes makes mistakes. He's very morally gray and just fits the bill of Grimdark really, really well. The story is told in an incredibly compelling way. Just when we're spending a little too much time on one timeline, Gabriel will leave us on a cliffhanger in that timeline and switch over to the other one. And this really kept me perpetually interested, wanting the next part of the story. And both timelines were incredibly interesting. There wasn't one that was better than the other, really. They, they both had their hooks in me and they both had their mysteries that were slowly being unraveled throughout the book. The book was also super funny. I couldn't even count the amount of times I was laughing out loud at the ridiculous things people would say and the extremely creative cursing, which, by the way, there's, there's a lot of it, but it never felt like 
it was swearing for swearing's sake. It always felt like it fit whatever situation. And it was always, you know, it was always something that would make you laugh. Um, and so it really wasn't too much. But I think compared to a lot of other fantasy books, it's a lot. <laughs> My least favorite part of the book is such a small and subjective thing, but it was just really, really long. Um, it was always interesting, but some of it probably could have been trimmed away to tell a slightly smaller, more concise story. I was never bored really, but at a certain point I was often checking to see how much time I had left on the audiobook and it felt a little daunting each time I saw that I still had a small mountain ahead of me. <laughs> I think if you're not someone who is used to reading long books, you could easily glaze over for a few chapters and miss a ton of stuff that's really important. The other very small complaint I have is not entirely a complaint, but this book very obviously takes huge inspiration from Blood Song by Anthony Ryan. Besides the vampires, a lot of the beginning of the book is a pretty close comparison to Anthony Ryan's famous work. He even has a love interest in the cute nun who works in the fortress. But about Maybe halfway through the book, it really takes off in its own direction, and there's not too many similarities from there on, besides the framing narrative being almost the exact same thing. So needless to say, I highly recommend this book. Um, be aware of the long ride that you're strapping in for, because it is really long, but definitely read it. I think this book has something for everyone, and don't let the bad U.S. cover art fool you. This is in no way a YA paranormal fantasy or anything like that. The main character isn't this super hot vampire sex god that you see on the cover. This book is extremely adult and dark, and just like Lights of Prague, these also are not your popularized modern Hollywood vampires. There are no good vampires in this world. When they change from human to vampire, they are definitely not the same. But definitely pick this book up. I, I had a ton of fun with it, and it's the first book in a long time that made me say, I absolutely need the second one right now after finishing it. It's honestly going to be a rough wait for book two after that ending. So anyways, guys, those are my three vampire-related books that I read recently. Have you guys read any good vampire books that steer away from the Twilight romanticized vampires? Post your recommendations below in the comments. I, I think the fantasy community is finally taking back vampires and making them scary and adult again. As always, we appreciate it when you hit those like and subscribe buttons, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Files Fantasy. Stay tuned for our next video where all three of us will discuss The Wise Man's Fear by Patrick Rothfuss, book two of The King Killer Chronicle. And until next time, guard your necks closely. You never know when a vampire is lurking about.